Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Do we honor God only with our lips while keeping our hearts from the Holy One? Do we deceive ourselves thinking we are religious rather than living faithful lives? Let us confess to God our sin and the ways we've missed the mark as children of God, trusting in the one who seeks to make us whole. We pray together. Holy one, we, we hear, hear your, your words, words every day, day but, but rarely dare to fully live them out. We hold on to resentments and allow wounds to fester. Our tongues rush to judgment while our words of hope and forgiveness struggle to find voice. We listen with impatient ears to the cries of the poor and oppressed. God of compassion, may your mercy fall on us like a summer shower on parched grass. May your hope overflow our hearts. May your beloved child, Jesus Christ, speak to us and call us to life. Amen. Listen and understand. The voice of the beloved speaks to us, implanting the word of hope, the word of grace, the word of forgiveness into our hearts. Open your souls to the good news. Every gift comes from God, especially the gifts of mercy and love. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us sing together, we are called. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, our strength, you transform our brokenness and hypocrisy into wholeness and faithfulness. Protect us from all dangers that threaten us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved to live faithful lives of humble service through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
Today's first reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2 and 6 through 9. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you nor take anything from it. But keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Today, we take time to reflect and meditate on the musical offering of Psalm 15, performed by Emily Heilman and the Psalms Project. Today's gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 through 15, and 21 through 23. 
Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do you, your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. If this story were to take place today, I think I would probably be in the same boat as the Pharisees and scribes in the question that they ask. If I saw Jesus eating with his disciples a meal, and we knew for sure that they had not washed their hands before they eat, say, Jesus, don't you know we're still in the middle of a pandemic? Don't you know that washing your hands is one of the key ways that you keep yourself safe from a virus? Don't you know that it's just good hygiene to be able to wash your hands before you eat? I say that tongue in cheek, right? But that has a lot to do with the lesson that we are in the midst of today. We are washing our hands. We're still wearing masks from time to time. We're still taking precautions to protect ourselves from a virus, something that is outside of us something that we don't want to have come in and defile and cause an illness within our bodies, right? We can all recognize that that is an external threat. It is something from the outside. And so we do things to protect us from those things that come in. But the reality is over the course of this pandemic, as much as we've been doing these things to protect ourselves against a virus from the outside, what we've missed all along is that there has been a virus at work on the inside. A virus that has been taking hold of the hearts and minds of human beings in our communities throughout this last year and a half. It's not a virus that makes us ill, but it's a virus that presents itself in the form of hatred, anger, division, divisions, all types of malice against other people the ways that we have treated one another in some segments of our communities over this last year and a half over issues of how we've responded to this pandemic have exposed that we have a virus of the heart already at work on the inside of us. I was listening to a podcast this week about what's happening in ICUs across our country over these last couple of weeks of the pandemic. And I was listening to an interview with a woman named Jenna. She's an ICU doctor in Minnesota. And in her community hospital, they're facing the same overwhelmed ICU that other parts of our country are and that they've experienced in other parts of the pandemic. But she said that something is different this time. As opposed to other waves that have filled up and caused all types of pain and heartache for the people that are working there, she said this time it feels like the families and the people coming into the ICU are treating us like firefighters that are going to put out a fire, but yet 
are continuing to yell at us and abuse us while we're doing so. People that are coming in with a heart of distrust and a heart of anger directed at those that are trying to save the lives of the people that are there for care. So that there is some form of a virus within the human heart that wants to take out our pain, take out our suffering on other human beings to transmit, to share our pain with others through how we treat them. I think this is at the core of this passage from Mark's gospel as Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees about this ritual of hand washing. Now, this ritual of hand washing in Jesus's time is something that despite what Mark's gospel says, that it's practiced by all of the Jewish people and communities, really was not practiced by all Jewish people. It was practiced by only the most religious, most sanctimonious Jews of Jesus's time. And it's a ritual that is not actually prescribed in the law. Some people would say, well, this is another example of Jesus abolishing the law, of which it is not. Because in fact, throughout all of the laws that are given in the Old Testament, especially in Exodus and Deuteronomy, there is absolutely no prescription for how it is that you are supposed to wash your hands before a meal. There's lots of prescriptions about what you can eat, how you can eat, who you can eat with, but there's no prescriptions about hand washing. There is a couple examples in Exodus of priests that have done certain types of ritual hand washing prior to presenting at a religious ceremony, but there is absolutely nothing in the law and commandments that says this is what you need to do to wash your hands before you eat. So what Jesus is getting at here with the Pharisees and scribes that are challenging his disciples and him is saying, you know what, there are certain human rituals and there are certain human practices that are just that, that they have nothing to do with the law and the commandments that was handed down to Moses at Mount Sinai in Exodus, or the commandments that Jesus was proclaiming that always come back to loving God and loving neighbor. Jesus says, this is simply one of your human rituals, and that this actually has nothing to do with the defilement or the making of someone unclean, because that's what they're most concerned with, right? Is that if you don't do something right, if you don't follow the commandments, then you are going to be deemed defiled or ritually unclean, which means you cannot present yourself as an offering at the temple before God and that you have to go through a cleansing ritual before you get to that point. And they're saying, Jesus, why are your disciples continuing to eat and pretend like they're not doing the right things? And so Jesus takes this opportunity in the midst of this example to say what defiles a person is not through your external religious or ritualistic behavior. What defiles a person is held within the human heart. And when Jesus says the human heart, he takes this as an opportunity not to talk just to the Pharisees and scribes. He's not talking about the people that are just right there in front of him. Eleven times he uses the word anthropos. Anthropos in Greek is the word used for human. Jesus is opening this up to everyone, to himself, to the disciples, to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to you and to me, that what defiles is held within our hearts as human beings. And he goes on to list quite the list, doesn't he? If I had to go through the list and ask which one you resonate with, that maybe is that deep, dark defilement within your heart, I don't think you'd probably want to raise your hand publicly, right? But it goes back again to that virus I talked about at the beginning. What Jesus is getting at is our capacity to do evil in the world, our capacity to hurt another person, to do something destructive against the love of God in the the world, in our communities. It's not something that comes from outside of us, but it's something that is held within our hearts. 
And Jesus is seeking in this moment, not just to convict us, not just to shame us, that we are human beings broken and that have the capacity for damage, but Jesus is seeking to transform his disciples and the Pharisees and scribes and us here today so that those things don't go on to cause additional hurt or harm in the world. Father Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest who lives in New Mexico and founded the Center for Action and Contemplation, he has a phrase about this. He says that all of us that do not transform our pain will surely transmit it to others. Let me say that again. Surely those of us who do not transform our pain will surely transmit it to others. Jesus in his death is a prime example of what this type of transformation looks like that Jesus put on the cross, is subjected to the evil hearts, not only of the Pharisees and scribes, but the betrayal and denial of his own disciples, the most faithful ones that followed him. In his suffering, in his death, he was taking the projection and the transmission of the pain of the world being directed at him. And he could have done different things than what he did. He could have lashed out in anger. He could have run from that suffering and pain. He could have told his disciples to pick up their swords and to start a war over what was going to be done to him. But he didn't. He humbly took his place and took that pain upon himself. And he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus chose in the face of pain coming at him to allow his transformed heart to take it and to not transmit that, but to continue to love through it. Jesus' resurrection then serves as the promise to us that that is possible for us today as well. That it's not just Jesus on the cross that has that capacity, but within our human hearts, when we receive that grace and forgiveness and unconditional love from God and allow that to meet us in our vulnerable places, in that place that we are hurting, that place that we are in pain, that place that we are suffering, that it can transform us and it can give us great capacity that when we are in the midst of difficult situations, when we may want to lash out in anger, when we want to may take out what we're feeling upon another person, that instead we can respond ourselves with that same love and grace of God. Think about it as a little bit of a sphere. If you could hold your heart right here out in front of you, outside of your body, that might be a little bit gross. But think about it. Think about you holding your heart right here. You may feel today that my heart, how I'm feeling today, may not have enough capacity to continue to give or to love, that that heart may be hurting. But what Jesus wants to do is to surround that heart with love and with grace, to be able to let you know that whatever your heart may be feeling that God's love is already bigger than that, trying to create more space for your heart to keep growing. And that day by day, as you come back to that love, that sphere, that circle of love that God is creating grows bigger and bigger if you allow it. If you begin to open your mind up to what that unconditional grace and love is, it's not just a little bubble around your heart, but it's a great big awareness that God's love encompasses all things, and that our hearts can be healed by that love and can grow larger as well if we allow God to hold it, if we allow God to heal it and be there with it. That's what I took away from Jenna, the ICU nurse that I talked about before, is that she went on from talking about the pain that her and her colleagues were experiencing that people were bringing into the ICU And she said, you know what we're going to keep doing, though, despite the pain, is we're going to keep working to heal other people. Despite what they may tell us, despite how they might treat us, 
Our objective is to keep working towards health and healing for every person that comes into that room. And that they are going to continue to serve and to love at the best of their capacity to make that be so. And I think that that's what our mission is of the church. We may not work in ICUs. We may not be doctors or nurses that have the capacity to respond to the pandemic. But we all as disciples have the capacity to treat that other virus, that virus of the heart, that virus of the pain and suffering that seems to be causing so much hurt in our world. But we have to allow God's grace and love to first transform us so that we can be that loving presence in the world. So sisters and brothers, let us return to God's amazing grace again today to hand over our hearts and allow God to love us so we can go and love the world. God's grace and peace be with each of you. Amen. children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church that it is a safe haven for all who seek your presence. Fill it with leaders and faithful followers who echo your expansive and generous welcome. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the whole of creation that plants and animals have the habitat and resources to thrive and flourish. Inspire us to protect threatened habitats and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for individuals in positions of authority throughout our world. Raise up wise and discerning leaders in all forms of governments and guide them to seek the benefit of every person. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are in need. Support and encourage those who are unemployed, underemployed, or experiencing poverty. Bring food, shelter, clothes, and stability for daily life. Surround all who are ill with your compassion. We pray especially for... Paul Parsons, Dick Brundage, Sandy Brundage, 
Susan Marsh, Al Schlager, Maggie Martinez, Harold Walker, Gail Larson, Dorothy Riglin, Bill Margheim, Jean Rhine, Helen Holmes, Jim Moss, Eric Larson, Justine Ager, Brian Braun, Bob Scrivano, Elena Martinez, Heidi Simon, Renee Schroeder, Ethel Dixon, Sean Sugden, Aaron LaBelle, Eugene Scarborough, Jocelyn Penley, and Theta Hart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are still providing care to patients suffering from COVID in hospitals and ICUs throughout the world. In their exhaustion, provide respite. In their fear, provide trust. May your healing come to those who are ill and those practicing the healing arts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. We lift them up to you as an offering as we pray together. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to be the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please, from your seats, offer a sign of peace to those around you today. At this moment, uh, we acknowledge our offerings before God. There is an offering plate available here at the front of the worship space that you can leave offerings in before or after worship. And we give thanks to God for the ways that God will continue to multiply those gifts for the sake of the mission of the church in the world. We prepare our hearts for communion at this time. I invite you to have one of the communion cups available to you or a form of bread or drink that are available to you if you're online with us today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Our hearts overflow with praise and thanksgiving. God our God. Your beloved's voice spoke to chaos, calling forth the flowers of grace which bloom in our hearts. Because you love righteousness, you would anoint us with the oil of joy and clothe us in the robes of mercy and goodness. But we break your heart by embracing the very wickedness you hate, staining our lives with sin and death. Still you love us and seek us out, for in Christ your grace has defeated sin, and the risen Lord has opened, way, opened the way to life in your kingdom. Into our lives you sent your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our companion, the joy of your heart. Gazing into our souls, he sees our emptiness and fills us with your grace. Listening to our pain, he is quick to speak healing and hope to us, the perfect gift of life. He declares that sin is past, death is over and gone, and resurrection blossoms in our hearts forever. We remember that in the night before he showed us the full extent of his love, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for remembrance of me. Generous God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon those who gather around your table and upon the gifts of the bread and cup, as they are the body of your servant and the spirit of your compassion. May we become the healing and hope the world longs for in our time. As you touch our lips with your life, may we be quick to speak of justice 
as you pour grace into our hearts. May we be the doers of your word, those whose hands are sustained by generous acts of kindness, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, lifting the fallen to their feet, comforting all who are broken. That when your spirit unites us at your table in heaven, as we clasp hands with all your beloved, we will sing your glory for all eternity. God in community, holy one. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. With whatever elements are before us today, because God loves you just as you are, with whatever you've done or left undone, and in spite of anything that the world says about you, we proclaim together that all are welcome to receive these gifts from God's table today. For in Christ, all means all, and the gifts of God are free. Today, we will celebrate communion as one body at the same time. I'll offer the words for you, for us here in person, and for anyone watching the video at home today. I invite you to prepare now your wafer by peeling back the first layer of the communion cup that you have, and that you can then, uh, have access to the grape juice by pulling back the second layer. Let us now receive this great meal of unconditional love, the bread of heaven and the cup of grace. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. There are baskets underneath many of your seats. Please pass those baskets around to one another that you can use as a receptacle for your communion cups. And I invite you to now hear a blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. We sing together, go my children with my blessing. As we prepare to depart this space and live out our worship in the week ahead, 
Let us pray together. God God of of hope, you you have have renewed our identity identity as your children children, and are sending us forth with songs of love within our hearts. Let us serve beside Jesus, tearing down barriers which keep our world from wholeness and peace. Allow your spirit to empower us, not only with kind words, but with generous actions, forming us into your body, given for the life of the world. In your name, Holy Trinity, we pray. Amen. May God bless us and keep us. May Christ's face shine in us and be gracious unto us. May the spirit who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon us now and forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God.